Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Before we get started, we'll have a few moments of silent prayer to give each one the opportunity to make sure you're in fellowship, opportunity to use 1 John 1, 9 if necessary, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for all your many expressions of grace in this congregation. We're thankful for the answer to prayer in relation to the the need for uh, the financial need for uh, Camp Arete. We pray for the camp that's going to begin in about a week and a half. We pray for their safety on the road. We pray for the counselors as they prepare for. Uh, working with these kids. We pray for the kids that you would be preparing them spiritually to be receptive to that which is taught at camp. And we pray that things would go well, that we'll be healthy and strong, and there won't be any injuries or problems at camp. We just are thankful for all of those who are involved with the camp in putting everything together and and, uh, providing this tremendous ministry. Father, we're thankful for the way you're working in this congregation in a variety of different ways and the way in which the word goes out, not only here in Houston, but around the country and around the world. And we just continue to pray that you might uh, make your word fruitful in the lives of people. We're thankful for your grace. Now, Father, as we study this evening, we pray that we might be challenged by the things we study, come to understand them more completely, more fully, that we might accurately handle your word and that we might be able to be encouraged and strengthened by it. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are in Acts 16. We're going to wrap up the little study we've been on, uh, sort of a topical study related to demon possession. This is an important issue because uh, there's so much confusion over this. This is one of the reasons that uh, 20, I can't believe it's been 23 years that Tommy Ice and I wrote the book that in its latest rendition is called What the Bible Teaches About Spiritual Warfare. And by the way, that book is at a printer right now and will be out sometime, we hope, maybe by the end of the summer. And that is uh, that just another provision of God's grace to put that, be able to uh, put that back into print after uh, 21 years of being in print through uh, secular, uh, not secular, but through the normal Christian publishing ho- uh, market. Uh, it was taken out of print last year, and so we put it back into print on our own. And uh, God has provided a, uh, a wonderful logistical support for that. A guy came out of the blue who has a successful business and uh, said that anything we need to have published, he'll be glad to. Uh, uh, he's got a little publishing business. He'll be glad to do it. His wife does uh, is a graphic artist and does that. And so it's just another example of how God provides and supplies the need for so many different things. And there's some other things in the works too. I keep I keep hearing that the new because it's been 10 years since we launched the last uh, uh, rendition of the deanbible.org website, and a new one is within weeks, not months. That's what I hear. And the, and I've see, gotten a glimpse at some of the new artwork and different things, and these guys have been busy. Let me tell you, the people in this congregation who help out are just incredible. There is such a support team here. And I know Jack Keith and Barb and I know I'm going to leave people out because there are people who are doing things that I don't know anything about. Uh, Gregory Freehoff, uh, others are doing things. And um, whereas right now we have a <clears throat> we have an index 
there's uh, somebody I think who's going to try to do, do that's gotten involved that does programs for data mining, and so we're going to be able to take the transcripts that some of you have worked on and put those out there, and then the program itself will, um, you know, make the National Security Agency envious in the way it can data mine all of the all of the doctrinal material that's on the website so that people can go in and type in a scripture reference or a topic and it will pull up every everything that that has been taught or prepared or written on that particular topic so there's some some uh uh, great stuff that's getting ready to come out so hopefully all of those things will be out by the end of the summer we're in Acts 16, and the way the episode has developed is the Apostle Paul has been uh, confronted here by this uh, fortune teller who is demon-possessed. Now, last time we talked about the issue of demon possession. We've talked about the activities related to demon possession, and I want to remind you that one of the things I emphasized is that uh, we have to be very careful. Uh, so often people say things like, if you get involved in fortune-telling, reading the astrology column, playing with a Ouija board, uh, other forms of juju black magic, that you can pick up a demon. But the reality is, every unbeliever is born, Scripture says, in the domain under the authority of Satan, in the world system. And as creatures that are spiritually dead, they are already in carnality. And when we have examples in the Gospels of children who have, are demon-possessed, that's not a result of a volitional decision. That's not because they were going out and they were getting involved in the dark arts and the occult at the age of two and three. It's because they're in the devil's world, and as such, they are... Um, they, they can, that can happen. Now, all, of, all the things that Satan and the demons do are under God's authority, so that can happen. And we have to look at Scripture also and realize that there are only certain periods of time in history, in scriptural history, that demon activity was overt. One of those was during the time of the incarnation of Christ and during his ministry on the earth and the establishment of the church. One of the things I'll point out to tonight is that if demon possession is the major problem, a lot of these so-called deliverance ministries, uh, what I call the neo-spiritual warfare teachers, emphasize, then the scriptures from the Gospels on are, are I mean, from at the end of Acts, the epistles written for church-age believers are, are incredibly silent. I mean, there's just no mention of this. And the epistles are written to teach us as believers everything we need to know to live the Christian life. So if, if demon, act, demon possession, not, not demon influence, but demon possession, is the problem that people think it is, then why is the Bible so incredibly silent? And my emphasis has been that we have to understand what the Bible teaches we always run into problems when we start interpreting the Scripture on the basis of our experience. We have to remember the key principle, you interpret your experience based on the Bible. People have all kinds of experiences. People claim to speak in tongues. Well, I can't challenge their experience. You can't challenge somebody's experience. I can challenge their interpretation of their experience. But when they say, oh, I've had this experience, I, God talked to me, great, wonderful. But something happened. You did have an experience. You didn't dream it up. You had an experience. But what you think that experience was probably isn't what you think it was. Okay? It's, it's something different. The Bible teaches something different. So we have to learn to interpret our experience with the Bible, not interpret the Bible with our experience. So Paul, But there really is such a thing as demon possession. Uh, there was at the time of Christ and in the first century. And Paul came face to face with that in, in Philippi, in Philippi. And they were followed around by a uh, slave girl who was a fortune teller. And she brought a tremendous income to her masters. The Roman, Greco-Roman world was very open to 
uh, fortune tellers and necromancers and all of these things. People had no hope, no certainty, so to bring some sort of stability into their lives, they wanted information about the future. And so this was a lucrative income for the owners of this slave girl who had a demon. We looked at all the vocabulary in the last two lessons showing that that is a one of several ways in which the Bible clearly spoke about demon possession where a demon enters into and controls the body of an individual and that that was very different from demon influence which is just has to do with thinking according to the ideals of Satan's uh, world system there in uh, Philippi here indicated by the uh, red arrow on the left the other red I mean red star the other red star represents Neapolis where they they landed before they went to Philippi Acts 16, uh, 16 tells us that this young girl had a spirit of divination. Uh, literally, she had a, a spirit, a puthanos. Uh, uh, puthanos is where we get our word python. This was related to the uh, spirit that uh, inhabited the oracle at Delphi, giving uh, that priestess the alleged ability to foretell the future. She would follow the Apostle Paul and Silas and Timothy around, saying these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. And in the, literally in the Greek, it could be translated a way of salvation because there's no article present. But the reality is that Paul doesn't need to have his message validated by demonic powers. And so after some time, he became uh, greatly annoyed and irritated with this. And he cast out the demon. Again, I want to emphasize the Bible uses very precise language. Doesn't ever use the term exorcism to refer to what Jesus, the disciples, or the apostles did. It always uses the term cast out. The only ones who performed exorcisms were those who were involved in magical and religious rites that sought to free people from uh, demon possession. So never use that word exorcism of what the Bible teaches. It, it's always, that's a different word. That always relates to the uh, Satan using Satan to cast out Satan, so to speak. Now the result of this is that when uh, her master saw that the hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them to the marketplace, and to the authorities. So they're going to drag them to the uh, marketplace, which is the Agora, which was located in this green area here. Later, they're going to take them to the forum here, which is where there was a, a Bema seat, where the ju judge and the magistrates would sit, and they would bring formal charges against them. Uh, last week, I showed you this chart that Ace Erkamai means to go into, Ekbalo means to cast out, and Ex Erkamai means to come out or God. Those are the technical terms that we see with demon possession. So that tells us exactly what demon possession is. It's a demon entering into a person. Now that raises the question, has for many people over the years, can a Christian be demon possessed? Can a Christian be demon possessed? And this is one of those areas of that where experience has entered in more than uh, more than anything. How do you even know if a person is demon possessed? What are the telltale signs? Because there, the scriptures give a variety of different uh, symptoms, you might say, or different characteristics of those who are demon possessed, and they're not all the same. And many people think, oh well, I can tell. How can you tell? What gives you the insight? What gives you the information? And there have been many people over the ages who have uh, given the characteristics so you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt if your neighbor is demon-possessed. I always wondered what those noises were at night. Well, in the 3rd century A.D., Rabbi Huna, a Jewish rabbi, identified four characteristics of someone who was demon-possessed. They would walk about at night. Now, anyone over the age of 50, I think, is going to identify with this problem, with a little what I call middle-aged insomnia. You know, walking around the middle of the night, seeing if you can catch Perry Mason on the rerun channel or something else, and watching the news, watching... Um, oh, what's that show that Fox News runs at 2 o'clock in the morning? Red Eye, yeah, watching Red Eye or something like that. 
Yeah, walking around at night. Yeah, I've <clears throat> spent many a night watching Red Eye. Spending the night on a grave. I don't think I've ever done that. That would be kind of unusual to go to sleep in a graveyard. Although in my first church, the church had a graveyard. And I always loved the fact that living in the, the manse, as they called it, I had very quiet neighbors. So I didn't... Uh, Spend the night on a grave, but spent the night next to a graveyard. I'm tearing one's clothes. Uh, of course, in the Old Testament, in Jewish culture, that was a sign of grief, as you would tear your clothes. So when is the tearing of one's clothes indicative of, of uh, demon possession? When is it not? Or destroying what one is given. Now that seems like, in some ways, especially compared to some other lists, that seems to be a rather mild list. Uh, other evidence that people are demon-possessed is given in a list by 17th century Puritans, 1600s. So these lists are built off of experience, empiricism. The Bible says nothing about these things. If you think you're possessed, maybe you are. If you lead a wicked life, if you are a sinner, then maybe, you know, that, that's just another form of the devil made me do it mentality. Uh, to be persistently ill to fall into heavy sleep, or vomiting up unusual objects, either natural objects uh, or you know, toads, serpents, worms, irons, or artificial objects, you know, nails or pins. You never know what might come up. So that was their idea. Or to blaspheme. I don't think I'll make a comment upon that. To make a pact with the devil, to be troubled with spirits, to show a frightening and horrible countenance. That means don't look at yourself in the mirror in the morning. Uh, you might think you're demon-possessed overnight. To be tired of living. You know, that's one of the big tests in the spiritual life. I see this more and more as I have close friends that are aging. We do get tired. We're ready to go to be with the Lord. And we're tired of the battle. But we need to continue to persevere and learn to love the battle. But this is an ind indication of demon possession. I, I wonder where they came up with that. To be uncontrolled and violent. To make sounds and movements like an animal. Okay, so see the difference between the 3rd century Jew and a, second, and, a, and a 17th century Puritan. Quite different. Where did they get this? Neither of those lists reflect any of the characteristics revealed in the demon possession narratives in, in the Scripture. Now, in modern times, we've got a man by the name of Kurt Koch. He was German, and he wrote a number of books on the occult back in the 50s and 60s. Quite popular. Uh, these were uh, in the biography, our bibliography. I was, we were given in our Satanology and Demonology course at Dallas Seminary, and um, not be, not that they affirmed everything he said, but is this was very popular literature and needed to be read. It was much more uh, much more informative, educated than books like, let's say, Pigs in the Parlor. Anybody here ever read Pigs in the Parlor? See, you're, none of y'all have a background in, in the charismatic movement, I can tell. But Pigs in a Parlor was a very popular book back in the 60s and 70s, and it was all about how you know everybody's just demon-possessed, and you need to be... The reason you have problems is you've got a spirit of this and a spirit of jealousy and a spirit of lust and a spirit of alcoholism, and it would get much worse than that. But it was, it was a, a really a strange book. But according to Kurt Koch, who's considered an expert on the demonic, uh, you can tell if a person's demon-possessed by if they're cursing, if they're grinding their teeth. I know some of you probably sleep with a, uh oral apparatus, so you don't grind your teeth at night. Well, maybe you're demon-possessed. Um, suicide or falling into a trance. Now, I know some of you fall into a trance two or three times a week, right about 20 minutes into the message. But I don't think you're demon-possessed. I think you're getting the best sleep of your day, probably. So Koch stated that possessing demons emit, quote, they emit a scornful laugh if you hear someone talk about the cross of Christ or the blood of Jesus. And see, the problem with that is that that, that flies in the face of the scriptural evidence. The scriptural evidence is when confronted with the gospel or with Jesus, they're, they're forced to recognize the authority of God. They, they may not like it, but they're, they're forced to. 
And they're not disrespectful or blasphemous of Jesus when Jesus shows up. We saw that in Mark 5 last week with the story of the, uh, uh, demon, the Gadarene demoniac. Uh, Kodge goes on to say that the person possessed will display evil and hateful expressions, especially if, sp- if spiritual things are talked about. Now, see, this is a problem today is that we form our theology too often on the basis of some kind of experience that somebody has had. And so these questions get raised. Can a Christian uh, be be demonized? Now, here's a um, quote from uh, someone who came out of a background very similar to ours. Later on, he uh, became one of the most popular radio Bible teachers. Later, he became the president of Dallas Seminary, and now he is pastor of one of the largest churches in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. And he said, can a Christian be demonized? For a number of years I questioned this, but now I am convinced it can occur. But listen to his basis. If a ground of entrance has been granted the power of darkness. What's a ground of entrance? If you're playing with your Ouija board or tarot cards or getting involved in seances or spiritism, that opens you to the demonic. I would say that biblically, if you're in carnality or if you're a spiritually dead unbeliever, you've opened yourself to the demonic because of your circumstances. But he's saying if you have a ground of entrance, such as trafficking in the occult or or a continual unforgiving spirit, a habitual state of carnality, the demon sees this as a green light, okay to proceed. That was in Chuck Swindoll's little book on demonism. So we have a lot of different people coming out of our camp. Uh, I could quote several. Another was uh, Hal Lindsey. Hal Lindsey was a believer in this as well. In his little book that came out back in the 70s called Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. Uh, He articulated the same position. But all their arguments ultimately come down to this question of experience. And one of the most profound that that we need to remember is one of the most educated, erudite, uh, informed scholars, Old Testament professor for many years at Dallas Seminary, author of numerous books, Merrill Unger. If you've heard of Unger's Bible Handbook, Unger's Bible Dictionary, he wrote a one-volume commentary, big, thick one-volume commentary on the Old Testament. uh, And Unger was just great. I, I got to hear him one time in chapel Early in uh, in the mid, or about seventy four or so, just one of those great old curmudgeons that got in the pulpit, didn't care about anything anymore, and just told everybody what the Bible what the Bible taught. But he had one major flaw when when Doctor Unger wrote his doctoral dissertation, it was on demonology, and it was published later as the book Biblical Demonology, and he argued very clearly in that book that Christians could not be demon possessed. And for that, he received a load of, of critical mail. Almost said email, but they didn't have email back then. A load of mail from Christian missionaries, who he was, some of whom he respected, who said, well, I've been on the mission field here in China or South America or Mexico or Africa, wherever, and I've had experiences, I've seen cr- people I knew were Christians who manifested the characteristics of demon possession, and they were demon-possessed. This is why I went through those silly little lists of how you can tell if a person's demon-possessed. How do you tell if a person's demon-possessed? How do you know? How do you know they're just not in need of medication? How do you know that, that it's not uh, just the fact that they, they've got some, uh, some demon acting upon them from the outside? How do you know any of this without revelation into the area of the unseen? The only certainty we have is, is, is the Scripture. So we can't make these kinds of decisions and diagnoses of people when, uh, on simply empirical evidence alone. I don't have, as a, as, a, as a Bible student, I don't have to know what's really causing the problems that a person is experiencing. I just need to know what the answer is. And the answer is the cross, if they're not a believer, and it's getting in fellowship and learning to walk by the Holy Spirit if they are a believer. That's the solution. 
The Word of God and the power of God is sufficient, and I don't need to get in, understand what all the dynamics are that are causing them to act in the way they are. People who live in extended carnality, divorced from the reality of God's Word, are going to manifest all kinds of sy- symptoms related to neuroses and psychoses. And, and I can't identify what the issues are if I don't know the, the, all that da- data. So we have to understand what the Scripture teaches, and then we can, we can, be, uh, we can deal with these issues. Now, the, what are the reasons that, that the Scripture teaches on why a person can't be demon-possessed? And we've identified exactly the, what demon possession is. That's where all of these books, there's just such a mount, mountain of books out there today that teach uh, this new or what I call neo-spiritual warfare. Uh, so what is it that we go to? Well, the first argument, what I think is still the strongest argument, is the fact of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, you may have heard this. The popular version of expressing this argument is, is actually logically fallacious. It's not true. But that's the one that most people have heard. And it goes something like this, that a Christian can't be demon-possessed because a demon can't live in the same uh, environment can't be present in the same environment as God the Holy Spirit. So it, it logically goes something like this. Major premise is every believer is indwelled by God the Holy Spirit. Uh, minor premise, the Satan or demons cannot be in the same space or location as, uh, as the Holy Spirit. Therefore, Christians can't be demon-possessed. The problem is we have passages like Job 1, Job 2, uh, other passages where, where Satan goes before God. Zechariah chapter 3 is another one where Satan and the demons are in the very presence of God. First Kings 22, God has a convocation of all the sons of God in his presence. So there's scriptural evidence that that's just not true. And it's not true because, and remember this, this is a good example of something that really bothers me. We have a lot of people who emphasize doctrine. What doctrine is often is a, a principalized summary of what the Bible teaches. But often when we principalize and summarize, we get away from the literal text of the Word of God. And we create an abstract point that has, lost, has, has slipped its anchor from the text. And that little pithy little uh, syllogism has slipped its anchor from the text. And this is, a, this is a real problem. We always have to have a biblically grounded view of everything. Don't get too far away from what the text actually says. Don't get into uh, abs- a too much abstract theology. What the Scripture says is not simply that the believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's not the strength of the whole argument. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 1 Corinthians 6.19 both state, before they state the fact of indwelling, they say, don't you know that your body is the temple of God? Now, the point that I made in defining demon possession as a demon who is able to take up residence inside your body and to control your body, that's in turn, we're talking about the body. Well, what, the, what 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 6.19 say is that your body is a temple, a temple to the Holy Spirit. And so the, there are two different words that are used in the New Testament for, or in Greek for, for a temple. The first is the word naos. The second is the word heron. Now, naos refers to the holy of holies, whereas heron refers to the entire temple precinct. Now, the Bible doesn't say that your body is a Huron. It says it's a Naos. It's like the Holy of Holies. Now, if anybody entered into the Holy of Holies without going through proper cleansing as prescribed in the Old Testament, what happened to them? They died. God didn't give them access. You couldn't just skip your way into the Holy of Holies unless you were following all of the correct procedures. Now, anybody could go into the... uh, outer courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles, the court of the women, the court of the Jews. Anybody could go there. But you had to follow strict procedures to get into the naos. 
And so your body is a naos. It's not just that the Holy Spirit dwells in you. It's that he's converted your body from the instant of your salvation into a holy of holies for the indwelling of the God the Father and God the Son. And so this makes it very, very distinct. Think about some Old Testament examples of what happened when uh, the, the regulations of God regarding the nows were violated. In Leviticus 10, 1 and 2, Nadab and Abihu, Abihu, two sons of Aaron, decided that they were going to write the rules for worship, and they carried uh, unsanctified fire, which was unauthorized by Scripture, into the Holy of Holies in order to light the, the, the censer, in order to light the candles. And they died. God took their life instantly, instant death penalty. Uh, in another example, in Second Samuel 6, verses 6 through 7, David was moving the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant into to Jerusalem, eventually for the construction of a temple on, on the Temple Mount at the threshing floor of Aruna the um, uh, Jebusite. What happens is uh, the cart is rolling up the rocky road. It hits a chug hole or bounces off of a stone, and the Ark of the Covenant jostles a little bit. And one of the priests, Uzzah, reaches out his hand to stabilize God. But God doesn't need to be stabilized. And I'm saying it that way because the ark represented the presence of God. And no one was allowed to touch the ark. And Uzzah dies instantly because he violated those standards of God. So the, the scripture we have indicates that, that in the very presence of God, in that which he has sanctified and set apart as his dwelling place, as a temple, Nothing unclean or evil or wicked enters into that uh, that sanctuary. Uh, another illustration of this can be seen in just the layout of uh, of the Jews when they went through the wilderness. You had all of the tribes were given their specific positions around the tabernacle. The tabernacle was in, and when they camped at night, they each had their position all the way around around the tabernacle. Tabernacle was in the center. At the center of the tabernacle is a holy, uh, a holy of holies. Now, if sin existed in the camp, and it does in jo- uh, Joshua, I think Joshua chapter 4, after the battle of Jericho, uh, Achan, in violation of God's command, keeps some of the uh, booty, some of the plunder for himself, goes back to his tent, digs a hole under his tent to hide it. And as a result of that, the next day when they go into battle against Ai, the Israelites were defeated. A couple of thousand are killed. And so it's because of sin. Joshua is about to give up. God has uh, abandoned us. The people are, are terribly upset. They've gone from the uh, thrill of the victory at Jericho to the agony of the defeat at Ai. And so God takes them through this procedure where they gradually identify the tribe and then the clan and then the family of Achan. And because he's brought sin into the camp, it has polluted the camp. And God, uh, there's discipline, death penalty upon Achan and his family for bringing sin into the camp. So this whole issue of, of being undefiled in the inner sanctuary, is critical in Scripture. That's the imagery of these two verses. This is the strongest argument, I think, why Christians cannot be demon-possessive, because God has sanctified you as a naos type of temple, and that cannot be violated by Satan or, or the demons. A passage that <clears throat> summarizes that is First John four four. Greater is He that is in you than He that is in the world. Uh, <clears throat> so there is a, there are various attempts today. It's very popular to uh, to reduce these arguments to a false or weak premise and then to defeat them a straw man argument. But that doesn't doesn't really work. Uh, second argument is the from the Matthew in the Gospels the empty house illustration. And this is an analogy that Jesus used to teach what's going on in Israel, but it has application, I think, to understanding what is going on and what can happen in the life of an individual believer. Um, He says, uh, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. The context is that the Jews 
The Pharisees have now reached this, this crisis point where in their confrontation with Jesus, where they have, representing the, the nation, they have rejected Jesus' claims as the Messiah, and instead of accepting him as the Son of God, they're claiming that his real power comes from the devil. Beelzebul was another name in, in Second Temple Judaism uh, for uh, the devil. And so Jesus' response is, well, if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then that's evidence that the kingdom of God is is here, that there's a legitimate representative of the kingdom of God here, and that claim is being made upon you. And then he gives this illustration in verse 29, or how can someone enter a strong man's house? So you've got a person who's created a fortified location. They have uh, put barbed wire, concertina wire, around the uh, tops of the rooftops and on the tops of their fence around the home. Uh, <clears throat> in Mexico City, in the uh, better neighborhoods where people have a little bit of money, uh, if you go to the, the, the fences around some of the schools and around the homes, there's ground glass embedded in the concrete at the top of the brick fences with concertina wire up there to keep uh, any uh, r- bad guys from getting, from getting in. And so this is the idea of a strong man's house. So if you're going to plunder the house, you've got to infiltrate the house and bind the strong man. And then once the strong man is bound, Jesus says, then the house can be plundered. Now the house here represents the body. So something ha- that controls the body has to be bound before uh, it can be plundered. So then he applies this illustration to uh, the body and to demon possession. He says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man and he goes through dry places, so this unclean spirit, this demon's been cast out through exorcism or something, leaves the body, goes wandering around in dry places, looking rest, finds none, and comes back and says, well, I'm going to go back to the house from whence I came. And when he returns, he finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. This represents someone who has gone through moral but not spiritual reformation. They've cleaned up their life. They've gotten off of booze and pills and cocaine, and they've gotten rid of all the uh, women, loose women, and the wild parties and everything else that people get involved in. They've gone through a moral reformation but no spiritual regeneration. And so the demon comes back, and the house is swept and put in order. And he says, oh, this is such a wonderful place to live now. I'm going to go get my friends, all my fraternity buddies. And we're going to come back, and we're going to move in. So he goes and gets seven other spirits more wicked than himself. They enter, same word that we see in the demon possession passages, ace erkami. They go into and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first so shall it be with this wicked generation. So the illustration that Jesus is using of the way God is going to judge that generation of Jews is an illustration related to somebody who's been demon-possessed, the demon leaves, and then the demon comes back and re-inhabits the place. But there's no spiritual uh, regeneration. And so this indicates that that the unbeliever, the wicked, is the one who is uh, open to demon possession. We also have the high priestly prayer of Jesus. Jesus prays to the Father. This is a prayer that is part of his high priestly role, his intercessory ministry for everyone who is a Christian, for the entire Christian church. He says, I do not pray, praying to the Father, that you should take them, that is, believers, out of the world. Okay, we, in other words, this is a great passage for saying that you don't go off into monastic asceticism and isolate yourself from the world. Now, there are churches, there are Christians who do this. Uh, there are Christians that, that you and I know that love to go to really big churches, and they have workout gyms, athletic teams, they have Christian schools. Many of those things can be good in and of themselves, but basically what happens is that people go to these churches, and they isolate themselves, and they can't name you three unbelievers they've had a serious conversation with in the last five years because they want to insulate and isolate from the world so that they don't have any contact with the world. This isn't any different from from 3rd, 4th century uh, monastic asceticism. So Jesus prays to the Father, don't take them out of the world, 
but that you should keep them. And the word there, keep, is a word that means to protect or to guard. That you should guard them from the evil one. Now here we have a preposition in the Greek, the preposition ek. We'll look at another verse in a minute that uses the other preposition for source, apo. These prepositions can be quite uh, quite instructive. Here it uses, ek means separation. It's like in the uh, passages that talk about birth from the womb. It's separation from something. Okay, this preposition is, indicates severance. You're severed from something. You're separated from something. Whatever else our Lord intended, this would exclude the invasion of a child by God, uh, of God's body by unholy demon. A child of God's body by unholy demons. Since we know the Father is heard and is fulfilled and is fulfilling Christ's request, this must at least include protection of all believers. Christ is praying that we be protected from... The evil one, separated from the evil one. That preposition indicates a severance and a separation from the evil one. Uh, that would, at the very least, imply that we cannot be demon-possessed. Uh, the fourth point is in 1 John five eighteen and 19. John says, we know that whoever is born of God does not sin. Now, that doesn't mean that Christians don't sin. Paul uses that, I mean, John uses that phrase, whoever is born of God, as someone who is living in light of their regenerative state. Okay, because I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but everyone hold up your hand who's, who hasn't sinned. The, none of you are believers, right? Okay. We all need to get saved. See, if, if this means what it indicates on the surface, nobody's ever a Christian because Christians sin. So when, Paul, when, I mean, when John says, whoever is born of God, he's got to mean something other than just simple regeneration. And in, the, in, in 1 John, he, he uses that phrase to talk about those who are living like family members, not like the prodigal son. Whoever is living like a regenerate person should live. And um, it's, uh, it's sort of like um, uh, when, as a father or as a child, maybe you heard this. You did something that was truly publicly embarrassing for your parents. And they said, nobody in this family does that. That doesn't mean that you're not a member of the family. It doesn't mean that you've been disinherited. They're just stating a principle that your behavior didn't fit with the norms and standards of your family. And you had embarrassed them. That's close to what this is saying, is people who are members of God's family don't act like this. If you're acting like a member of this family, you don't sin. But we all know Christians do sin. So he goes on to say, But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. Verse, uh, 1 John five nineteen says, We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So the idea of touching here is the idea of holding on or grasping onto something and not letting go. It's not, not touching something like just reaching over and kind of uh, barely tapping it or touching it. It's grabbing hold of it and seizing control of it. So this is a passage that teaches something about the fact that uh, we are not susceptible to the control of Satan. Fifth point, we're protected from the evil one. In 2 Thess 3.3, 3, the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. And this is the uh, use of the other preposition that I was talking about earlier, the preposition uh, apha, which translated uh, means from. It's from the source of something, but when it's combined with uh, a word meaning to protect or to keep from something, it has the idea so that it is not lost or damaged. It is kept from harm so that it's not lost or damaged as part of that uh, idiom. So being protected from the evil one means that we can't be harmed by Satan. And demon possession, I think, would be getting harmed by Satan. And then the last argument, and this one I think also has great weight. It, uh, usually arguments from silence uh, don't have great weight, but this is not your typical argument from silence. This is an argument from sufficiency and silence. 
First, uh, Second Peter one three says, "As His divine power has given to us all things, not some things, not most things, not ninety nine percent of things, but all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue." Now, how do we have a knowledge of Him? The next verse says, by which we have given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. It's through the Word of God that we have a knowledge of God, knowledge of these things. And so uh, the Word of God claims to be a sufficient source of information for us on how to live the spiritual life. And the epistles specifically were written to explain the mystery doctrine of the church age to church age believers. And you can't find any reference to demons in the sense of demon possession, anywhere in the epistles. There's a recognition that we're involved in spiritual warfare, Ephesians 6, 10 and following. Uh, Paul talks about the fact that we are to uh, take down strongholds, which has to do with the ideas, uh, uh, satanic ideas in the soul. We're not to be conformed to the world. Uh, all of those things, but, but he doesn't ever mention demon possession. Neither does Peter, neither does James, neither does John. They're not mentioned. So if the scriptures are sufficient, and if this is a major problem that some people think it is, then the scriptures can't be sufficient. Or if they are sufficient, then demon possession isn't a problem at all for Christians in this age. That is an extremely powerful argument. Now what's interesting is after 23 years of our of Tommy's and my book being in, in, in publication. I have seen it reviewed negatively by several people. I have read a number of uh, uh, references and theologies and articles where they reject our view, but I have never seen anybody actually deal with any of our arguments. They just don't like it. And these are world-class theologians. I'm, I'm talking some, some people who've been president of the Evangelical Theological Society, written numerous commentaries, well-known, academically respected. But when it comes to dealing with what we've said, I, I've said this for years, I just wish somebody would have the spiritual guts to analyze our arguments. And if you don't agree with us, give us a, a rational biblical argument. They don't even attempt it. It's not that they give bad arguments to refute it. They don't give arguments. They just announce that we're wrong. And if they do give evidence, it's because I have in my file drawer over a thousand case studies of Christians who have been demon-possessed. Well, great. Give us one biblical argument. That trumps 10 billion case studies. One biblical argument. I remember early on when the book first came out, I think he's gone to be with the Lord now. Fred Dickinson taught theology at Moody Bible Institute for many years. And Tommy was on an interview with Fred Dickinson on a, on a, a radio show. And he just kept asking that question. And that was the exact response that Fred Dickinson kept giving. Here's a guy with THM from Dallas Seminary, THD from Dallas Seminary, taught for probably 40, 40 to 50 years at Moody Bible Institute. But he could not answer the question, give me a biblical answer to the argument. In fact, they would, I've had got people get just mad at me because I just kept saying, I just, give, me a, give me a biblical argument. So we have to deal with what the Bible says, not what experience says. And whenever we get involved with emphasizing the Bible, we usually irritate people and they get mad at us. Now in verse 20, this is exactly what happened when the Apostle Paul cast the demon out of the fortune-telling girl. And when the master saw that their prophet was gone, they grabbed Paul, dragged him into the marketplace, the agora, as I pointed out earlier, and uh, brought him to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates. So there's a, a couple of different words that are used here to describe these leaders, and they fit the context of this time. Remember I said uh, Philippi was a Roman, uh, Roman colony, and the magistrates would be known uh, by their Roman titles as either a praetores or as a duoviri. And Luke uses uh, two general terms for this office in these verses, archontos in the Greek and uh, strategi uh, in the Greek as well. And these are accurately translated rulers and magistrates. These are the civil authorities, the judges and the civil authorities in um, 
in uh, Philippi. So in verse 20 we read, they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Now, nobody really knows how they're troubling the city. There's a lot of debate in the commentaries over this, and and the bottom line on this is probably because as Jews, uh, even though there was a certain level of acceptance and, and freedom for the Jews to worship according to the law, they were considered kind of strange because they were monotheists in the Roman Empire. And they kept to themselves, and they did they did some proselytizing. And at that time, today uh, Jews are no longer uh, proselytizers, but they were in the in the uh, in the first century in Second Temple Judaism. And so um, uh, they're they're being accused of being Jews, not as Christians. They're Jews, and so they're seen as being troublemakers and and doing something that has cost the livelihood of these Romans, something that is legitimate. So that's the basic problem that's going on here in terms of uh, the second verse, teaching customs, where we get our word ethos, uh, ways of life. They're teaching a way of life which is not lawful for us. Now, there's no law against this in in Rome. Uh, It's simply that this was upsetting the normal way in which business was conducted and business was done, and Paul and, and Silas and Timothy were bringing a measure of absolutes to the situation and saying that, you know, there was something wrong with these uh, people who were involved with, with demonism. And so they bring them up on charges before, uh, before the magistrate. But they're also involved in irritating the crowd. Now, this is similar to what will happen in Ephesus in a few chapters. In a few chapters, we're going to see a huge riot that takes place in Ephesus because of uh, Paul's preaching the gospel, and uh, Ephesus was the center for the worship of uh, Artemis of the Ephesians, and we'll see some interesting things about her, but they would make these little figurines of her, and it was a great source of, of money and for these silversmiths in, in Ephesus. And when uh, they start getting a lot of conversions, people quit buying their little idols, uh, figurines of Diana of the uh, of Artemis of the Ephesians, and so they um, uh, they had a riot there. So this is a good way to get get uh, to try to influence government. We still see it today. If you weren't paying attention to the news today, uh, part of the Civil Rights Voting Act of 1965 was struck down. Not the whole Voting Rights Act of 1965. Not the. Uh, this isn't a. Ta- this isn't that the Supreme Court has suddenly turned racist. Although that's what some people are claiming. It is simply that after uh, after uh, 40, 50 years, that the Supreme Court recognizes that the states don't have to get federal government position in relation to changing certain voting laws. Well, I was listening to. Um, one of our more radical uh, black caucus, congressional caucus members, uh, Reverend Al Sharpton today. And he's talking about how they're going to go out and they're going to have, have all these meetings and they're going to have a march on Washington that's going to go far beyond the Million Man March. This is an affront to every black American. And that's not what this is doing at all. But this is the same methodology. It's, you know, rabble rouse. Get the populace all riled up. Don't deal with logic. Don't deal with the law. Don't deal with objectivity. Just get people emotionally invested in the, in the argument. And we see this so often when it comes to legislation in this country. And it's just it, people play the guilt Hard. They play the emotional heartstrings, and they don't deal with objectivity. And this is exactly what happens here. Uh, they they get the crowd, the multitude, rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off all their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. Now, this is an interesting thing. They're caning them. You know, we haven't had a good caning in Congress since about 1835 or 1836, but this was a... Uh, 
uh, typical punishment under the Roman Empire. And I'm not approving of caning when I say that, but sometimes we think that some of the fights that go on in Congress today are just a little bit... Uh, uh, we're, we're just so divisive. Well, back in the early part of the 19th century, uh, there were even examples of one congressman taking his cane and caning another one. We haven't had any physical fights in Congress in a while, which shows that we've improved. It's not worse. It's in some ways maybe better. So uh, that's what happens here. It, they have uh, officials... Uh, that are part of the court who are, whose responsibility it is to instigate the punishment. And so they would carry, uh, these, these, uh, lictors, as they were called, would carry a bundle of rods. And this was a symbol of their, uh, authority and a symbol of Roman justice. And then they would inflict these punishments by caning the criminals. So they took, uh, Paul and Silas and they laid many stripes on them. They're not whipping them. They're ca- literally caning them uh, with these rods. And then they threw them into prison, uh, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. So under Roman law, if the jailer let them escape, then the jailer would uh, uh, have his life taken. He would be executed. And so they're taken to jail. Now, this is the traditional jail site in Philippi. And I can't vouch that this is exactly the jail where the Apostle Paul and Silas were, but this is uh, the traditional site, and it was a jail, and that much has been documented, and so it's probably uh, a good chance that this is true. And they were put into stocks, and the Romans would put their feet and their hands into stocks so that it was a painful, very uncomfortable position, and they could not uh, could not relax. And then at midnight, as Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns. See, when your focus is on doctrine, even in the most horrible circumstances, it's somehow the horrible circumstances just fade into insignificance as you focus on the Lord. And the thing that you should remember is, and let me ask you this question, how many hymns could you sing? If you were put in jail tonight and you were going to be in prison for your faith, of course, you can have hymnals in prison here. I understand all that. Uh, you'll, be, you'll probably have, may have it better in some ways in prison than you do now. But uh, in, in many cases, uh, you may not have anything. How many hymns could you sing from memory? How many Bible verses could you say from memory? See, now's the time to do that. Don't, you, you don't wait till you're arrested. It's a little too late then. So Paul and Silas are praying and they're singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners are listening to them. They're not entertaining them. They're giving them the gospel and witnessing to them, and the jailer can hear all of this, so he's getting the gospel as well. And suddenly there's this earthquake, and the foundations of the prison are shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains are loosed, but nobody leaves. Because Paul and Silas understand that if they leave, this is going to put the jailer's life in jeopardy, and so they exercise grace orientation, and they stay right there in their jail. Now, the jailer has been asleep. There's an old story, old question, who's the smallest person in the Bible? Some people think it was Nehemiah. Other people think it was Bildad the shoe height. But it's the Philippian jailer because he slept on his watch. So the keeper of the prison, awaking from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, assumes that they've all fled because that would be the normal thing to do. And so he grabs his sword and he's about to kill himself when Paul calls out and says, Don't harm yourself, for we are all here. No one has left. That shows the respect that the others in the prison had acquired for Paul in watching how he handled his adversity. You know, do we acquire the same respect from those around us by the way we handle our adversity in prayer and singing hymns to God? So he called out for a light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas, and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, he's not just talking about being delivered from penalty. And the reason is, and I've read a number of commentaries who say that's what he's talking about. He's, he doesn't want to be executed. Why wouldn't he be executed? Nobody left. 
Only their chains came off, but nobody left, so he hasn't been put in jeopardy. His life's not in jeopardy. He's asking, how can he be saved? How can he be assured of going to heaven? And we get the most concise statement of the gospel here, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But see, this statement isn't in a vacuum. We've already been told that Paul and Silas are praying and they're singing hymns, and they've been talking about the gospel. So the, the jailer has heard all of this. They've already heard the sermon. Now he's getting the invitation. What do I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He already knows who the Lord Jesus Christ is. He knows what believe is. And then added, and your household. And the reason is, is because people still live mostly with their families. And there's several examples of households getting saved in the book of Acts. So then we're told, then they spoke the word of the Lord to him. That is, they give further explanation of the gospel. And they go to his home and tell his family the gospel. That's what it means, They all who are in his house. And he took them the same hour that night. Notice he wa- washes their stripes. That means he cleans his, cleanses their wounds and bandages them. And then immediately he and his family were baptized. Not a week later, not two weeks later, not, three, not even 55 or 60 years later. But immediately he and his family were baptized. Then we, we learn the next verse. Now when he had brought them into his house... He set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed, and it's a perfect active participle here with the idea that because they had already believed. So by this time, they've all heard the gospel, they're all saved, and so uh, and they've all been baptized, and now they have dinner. When daytime came, the magistrate sent to the officers, uh, <clears throat> saying, let those men go. Now, they want to cover this up. Because they, they've seen this has happened, they're loose, so they say, let those men go. And so the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul and say, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now depart and go in peace. Now Paul would say, great, I'm out of jail. Got my get out of jail free card, I'm going to go. But Paul says, no, I'm not going to let them get away with this. See, some people today would say, oh, this is Christian activism. You're being arrogant. You're rubbing the authority's nose in their false law. No. They're not. Paul is asserting his right. He has, this is the legal right. It just I get irritated and impatient sometimes with Christians who think, you know, all we need to do as a citizen is to pray. Pray and grow spiritually. Well, that's the silliest nonsense I've ever heard of. You're a citizen of the United States. Your responsibility as a citizen of the United States, whether you're a Democrat, whether you're a Republican, whether you're an independent, whether you're tall, fat, skinny, brown, black, blue, green, whatever you are, as a citizen of this country, your responsibility is to be an informed voter and to vote and to be involved. And that involves in everything from local precinct politics all the way up because that's the importance of being a citizen of the United States. This is the greatest country on earth. And you are born as a citizen born in this country You are invested with these responsibilities. It doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you're a Christian. But if you're a Christian, you have to do everything to the glory of God. And that includes being a citizen. You should be the best citizen in the entire country if you're a Christian. The most informed citizen. uh, Most involved citizen. That's not activism. That is responsibility. And that's how you become salt and light in the midst of a wicked and perverse generation. But if all you do is sit and read your Bible and pray, you're a fool. You know, it, it, some people think, oh, you know, I'm just going to pray that God will cut my grass. They pray all day long, all summer long. At the end of the summer, they got a yard full of weeds and the grass hadn't been cut. Because God said, you know, gave you the responsibility to get up and cut your own grass. You have to pray and cut the grass. You have to pray and vote. So Paul challenges them. He says, they've beaten us openly. We can't let them get away with this. They have violated Roman law, and I'm a Roman citizen, and they can't do this to us. I'm asserting my legal rights. And they have got to make this public. They can't just do it privately. And so he says, uh, and now do they think they'll put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come themselves and get us out. 
Paul stands his ground, the magistrates are going to have to come and make it as public a release as it was an indictment and an arrest. So verse 38, the officers, told, were, uh, the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. See, you could not beat or whip a Roman citizen. And they had done that. They hadn't even asked Paul. But if they had, he wouldn't have claimed it then because he was with his companions and he's a firm believer in the unity of the church and he wasn't going to assert personal privilege and let his, his fellow believers go to, go to jail and him not go to jail. So he would not have asserted his privilege to begin with. Verse 39, Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they, they say, you know, it's nice having you here, but don't let the grass grow under your feet. And so they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. When they had seen the brethren, a few final words of encouragement and exhortation from the Scripture, they departed. And from there they go to Thessaloniki. And we will come back uh, next time and begin our study on Thessaloniki. Now what's going to be interesting for you uh, and you'll get it a couple of different ways, because I knew it was going to happen this way, but I'm going to be leaving after the 4th of July event to go to Camp Arete, where I'm going to be teaching spiritual life to the kids that are up there. Uh, and we finished the Jude series to cover Tuesdays and Thursdays before uh, when I was gone the last time. We're going to begin a new series on First Thessalonians. And so you're going to, well, part of the intro to that gives background, but I knew it was going to happen, so I'm, I knew that you'd be getting Acts background and Acts 17, and, and I didn't want that to be too redundant. So we're going to uh, make adjustments for that so you won't be getting too much repetition. They'll, they'll complement each other. The introduction to Thessalonians, uh, Thess- First Thessalonians, as well as the background here from Acts 17. So it's good that those are coming Uh, very close together. Let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and to be reminded of your faithfulness and your power and your love for us, for you will not allow us to come under such egregious harm as to be uh, taken over, controlled by the power of demons or Satan, and that you are the one who protects us and watches over us. Father, we're thankful that you love us so much, that you care for us, you provided everything for us, and have given us everything related to life and godliness. And may we be diligent in the pursuit of excellence in our spiritual life, in every arena of responsibility. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.